Hi, financial accounting students. I hope you're ready to dive into chapter five, accounting for inventories. The very first thing I wanna do is jump over to our textbook. Here at the very beginning of chapter five, of course, I always encourage you to read the full chapter, but I wanted to start with this question from the curious accountant. The Kroger Company is one of the world's largest retail chains operating about 2,778 stores. As of January 30th, 2016, the company reported approximately $6.2 billion of inventory on its balance sheet. That's a lot of groceries, right? Kroger's a big grocery store chain. All right, so then in the notes to its financial statements, Kroger reported that it uses an inventory method that assumes its newest goods are sold first and its oldest goods are kept in inventory. Can you think of any reason why a company selling perishable goods like milk and vegetables would use an inventory method that assumes older goods are kept while newer goods are sold? So first of all, that sounds pretty gross, right? Secondly, I should comment, there's probably a lot of you that really never gave any thought to the concept of an inventory cost flow method until right now as it's being presented in class. So. In the real world, as we're dealing with inventory, we need to ask the question, when we're managing inventory physically and on our books for a business, are we accounting for our inventory item by item? Or do we make some assumptions that all of the items are kind of the same or pretty much the same? So this chapter, we're gonna be looking at essentially what we referred to as some inventory assumptions, some inventory cost flow methods. So we need to start by determining the amount of cost of goods sold and ending inventory using specific ID, FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average cost flow methods. Clearly we need to learn some terminology here first. So we have four acceptable inventory cost flow methods. I would actually argue that there's only three cost flow methods presented here and specific ID is not a cost flow method at all. It's literal item by item tracking. So specific ID uh, prior today may have been the only method that you thought existed is that we track each and every item of inventory on our books and physically. Um, but the reality is that's not always practical, nor is it always necessary or beneficial. So specific ideas, literal item by item tracking, and there's definitely a time and a place for that. Then we have FIFO, which is short for first in, first out, meaning if we buy A and then B and then C, we assume that we're selling A and then B and then C chronologically. Then we have LIFO, last in, first out. So if we were to buy A and then B and then C, under LIFO, we would assume that we're selling C and then B and then A. So in reverse order. And finally, there's weighted average where we're gonna compute a mathematical average and use that for our cost of goods sold and inventory per unit. Specific ID or specific identification. When a company's inventory consists of high priced, low turnover goods, the record keeping necessary to use specific ID is more practical and probably also necessary. When we think of high priced, low turnover goods, uh, the likelihood of us having truly identical inventory units is somewhat unlikely. If we're thinking of, for example, cars is the example that the textbook likes to use. So if we're going to a car dealership and buying a car, the likelihood of there actually being truly identical units of inventory at that car lot is somewhat low. Um, they might have, let's say we're going to a Honda uh, auto dealership. They're probably gonna have a whole bunch of Honda Civics there, but they're each gonna be slightly different. So one's going to have a different interior package and one's going to have a moon roof and one's going to have cloth interior, one's leather, and one's going to uh, have a different paint color or different wheels. So um, the likelihood of having truly identical high price, low turnover goods is somewhat low. 
but also just based on the volume of sales, it becomes both practical and necessary to use specific ID, item by item tracking. So in this case, if we do have units that are truly identical, we need to make sure we know which one is which, and we need to mark them somehow so that we know that this is item A and this other one is item B. So our company example today is the Mountain Bike Company, TMBC. So soon the Mountain Bike Company purchased two identical inventory items. First, they buy item A for $100, and then second, they buy item B for $110. So I've, I've added in item A and item B so that we can remember the chronology, the time order in which these items were purchased. But under specific ID, what we find out is that the chronology doesn't matter. Using specific ID, whenever item A, the first item is sold, our cost of goods sold would be $100. And whenever the second item, item B, is sold, the cost of goods sold will be $110. And item B could be sold before item A. We don't know, but we'll know because we have indicated which item is which, and we have it in our records that item A is 100 and item B is 110. So we need to track each item, specific ID. Then we have first in, first out, which is commonly called FIFO for short, not just in my classroom, but FIFO is a common name for first in, first out. And it requires that the cost of the items purchased first be assigned. So we're not tracking. Notice they use the word assigned to cost of goods sold. So we're not actually tracking the order in which our units are sold. We're making an assumption. This is a cost flow assumption. So the cost of the items purchased first be assigned to cost of goods sold first. So if we're back at the mountain bike company under the same scenario, we have two truly identical items. The first one, item A for 100. The second one, item B for 110. But this time, we don't care which one is which. We don't indicate which one is which. There is no way to tell the two units apart. They have been mixed around on the shelves, and it makes no difference. So we don't know which one is A or B. So under FIFO, the cost assigned to the first item sold Customer comes in, picks up one of those two items. We have no idea which one it is. The cost that we assign to it is going to be 100 because that was item A. Then later, another customer comes in and wants to buy the other item. And again, we don't physically know if it's A or B, but it's the second item sold. So we assume that our COGS is 110. So we bought item A and then item B then physically we don't keep track of it and we assume that when we sell them, we sell them in that order, item A and then item B. Then we have LIFO, last in, first out. So under this cost flow method, it requires that the cost of the items purchased last be assigned to cost of goods sold first. So now we're going in backwards order. So back at the mountain bike company, we buy item A for 100, and then we buy item B for 110. And again, you cannot tell the difference between the items. They've not been marked or labeled. We mix them around on the shelves. It doesn't matter which one is which. Customer comes in and wants to buy an item. We assume that it's the second item. We assume that it's item B. So we assign 110 to COGS. Then later, another customer comes in and wants to buy the other item, and we assume that it's item A, and we assign 100 to COGS. So now we're working backwards, right? We bought A and then B, and then we assume that when we sell them, it's B and then A. And so, and that would go, it would be backwards as many units as we buy, we would sell them in reverse order. So LIFO is going in reverse order. Then we have weighted average, which is a method that assigns the average cost of the items available to each unit of cost of goods sold and any inventory for that matter. 
So at the Mountain Bike Company, if we buy those two identical items, item A for 100 and item B for 110, to compute our weighted average, we're going to take the total cost of our inventory, 210, and divide it by the total number of units in our inventory, which was two. And of course, we get an average of $105 per unit. So every time we sell one of those items, item A or B, we don't know which one is which, and we really don't care, it's going to be COGS of $105. One thing I do want to point out, when it comes to weighted average, it's called weighted average because we give more weight to where there are more units. So we're not just dividing by two because there was two different price levels. So let's say, for example, that we buy two items for 100 and one item for 110. How would that change this problem? Two items at 100 and one for 110. So now we would have a total cost of 310 and we would divide it by three units of inventory. So now our new weighted average cost is going to be 103.33. And does that surprise you that the average is coming down? It's lower than 105 because we bought two items at a lower price. I'm pointing this out because I get a lot of students that would have still done the math just the same. They would have added up the two price levels and divided it by two. But weighted average, we needed to take the total cost of the inventory divided by the total number of units in inventory. And you can see we come out with less than 105 that the average is coming down because we have more units at the lower price. So one thing to think about here is the physical flow of goods. Our discussions about inventory cost flow methods pertain to the flow of cost through the accounting records, not the actual physical flow of goods. Our cost flow can be done on a different basis than physical flow. Now, knowing that, now if we go back and we think about that question from the opening of the chapter about Kroger, so first of all, I want you to be able to picture what FIFO, LIFO, weighted average look like physically. I think for specific ID, your best bet is to picture um, an auto dealership or something, a company that sells uh, probably high priced, low turnover goods. These are large purchases. So that's our specific ID. But going to our three cost flow methods, FIFO, LIFO, weighted average, I think it helps to be able to picture that. If you go into the grocery store, and specifically you're in the produce or the dairy section or the meat section, they want you to buy the older goods first, right? So if I'm looking around to buy, let's say a bag of salad, they're gonna put the older bags of salad in the front and the newer bags of salad in the back. Just like if I were to go over and pick out apples, a good produce grocer is going to rotate that produce so the older ones are on top and the newer ones are on the bottom and maybe the newest ones are still in the back of the store and haven't been put out for customers. If you think of what that would look like if they were operating on, on a LIFO basis, that's kind of gross. So they would just let you go ahead and buy the newest stuff first and leave the older stuff there. So our pile of apples actually has a bunch of mold and fruit flies flying around it. That's gross, right? Think of the dairy section. So ideally, the grocery store wants to sell goods on a FIFO basis. They want to sell the older goods first. So first in, first out. But I know me and probably some of you don't shop on a FIFO basis. When I go to the grocery store, I reach all the way around the back, I move everything out of the way, and I pull that bag of salad from the back because it's got an expiration date four days further out than the one in the front. Why would I buy the older one when there's a fresher one behind it? If you see me at the dairy case, I pull out all the gallons of milk and put them on the floor and I'll pull the gallon of milk out of the back of the dairy case because it expires five days further out than the ones in the front. Kind of silly, right? But why would I buy the older stuff when there's newer stuff right behind it? 
So I'm probably the grocer's worst nightmare, but I try to shop on a LIFO basis, but physically the grocery store wants me to shop on a FIFO basis. Can you think of a business that sells goods on a LIFO basis? Intentionally sells goods on a LIFO basis. It helps be able to picture it. The reality is a lot of retailers try to sell their goods on a FIFO basis, first in, first out. Um, and again, when we talk about these cost flows, we're talking about identical units of inventory. So obviously things with expiration dates, things that are perishable eventually, we want to sell first in, first out. And most retailers operate that way in terms of moving their physical goods. And sometimes really not for any reason, that's just their habit. But there are some businesses that will operate on a LIFO basis somewhat intentionally because it doesn't make sense to keep moving their goods the other way. So for example, I was talking to a student that worked at Home Depot and she said, well, absolutely in the garden section, we sell our plants FIFO, first in, first out. We don't want them to be there that long. We don't want to have to maintain them and take care of them. We want people to buy them and take them home. But when it comes to our hardware section, if I'm restocking all those little drawers of nails and screws and nuts and bolts, she goes, I'm not rotating them and pulling the old ones out and putting the newer ones on bottom. I just put another scoop right on top. So those are being sold on a LIFO basis. And I thought that was a great example to picture the difference between how they physically operate the garden section at Home Depot versus how they operate the hardware section at Home Depot. So different physical flows of goods. But again, our physical flow doesn't have to match our accounting cost flow. Another example of a company that would use a LIFO physical flow would be something like a dirt and gravel yard. So I have a friend that owns a dirt and gravel business. And so let's say they buy one load of inventory. You're going to get to witness my beautiful art once again. They buy one load of inventory and a dump truck comes and delivers a big pile of dirt, right? It kind of looks like this. <laughs> There's my dirt pile. Beautiful. So then they order another load of inventory and the dump truck comes and delivers it. Now, are they going to move the original pile of dirt out of the way to have the new one delivered underneath it? No, they're just going to heap it right on top. So here we're just piling more dirt right on top and it kind of spills down the sides a little bit. Lots of more dirt. Um, then they buy a third load of inventory. And again, are they going to move this old dirt out of the way to put the newer dirt on the bottom? No. So they're just going to let it pile right on top. The dump truck dumps it out and there's their pile of dirt, right? So then a customer comes in and says, I want to buy a bunch of dirt. Which dirt are they going to sell to the customer? Do you think they're going to dig a hole and sell them this dirt down here? I don't think so. Absolutely not. So they're going to sell them the dirt right off the top of the pile. So they're going to grab a shovel and they're going to shovel out this dirt. So it might include a little bit of the blue dirt, but most likely it's going to be LIFO, last in, first out, because they're not going to rotate their dirt or their gravel or whatever it may be. So that's kind of an example. That's what I picture when I physically think of LIFO. Oftentimes things that we keep in piles or heaps, things that don't perish in any way. They're not going to go bad. So that would be a physical example of LIFO. But most retailers are going to operate on a FIFO basis. So next time you go to a store, think about, do you think they're physically moving their goods FIFO or LIFO or maybe weighted average, which we can't physically represent that. Um, that's a mathematical computation. I guess the best thing we could think of is if we're selling something liquid, and it gets mixed together in a tank. So for example, a gas station, and they refill the tanks underground. So the old inventory and the new inventory are all just gonna get blended together, one and the same. So that, I guess, would be your closest thing to a physical example of weighted average. So again, the point being that our physical flow and our accounting flow can be two different things. 
However, if we do want to achieve the best matching, and you know how I love the matching concept, um, ideally we would try to match our physical flow to our accounting cost flow. But again, that's not required. So let's see what impact all of this has on our financial statements. So thinking back to our example with the mountain bike company, we looked at FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. No matter what, we were selling one item for $120. But under FIFO, we assumed that it was item A and therefore COGS was $100 and therefore gross margin is $20. Under LIFO, we assumed that we sold item B, which is COGS of $110 and therefore gross margin of $10. And under weighted average, we computed our average cost at 105. So we assumed that we are selling one of the two items and they all have the same average cost of 105 and therefore our gross margin is 15. You can see though, just in this basic example after selling one item that we have a significant difference in our gross margin. So we need to think about what impact that has on the company in the big picture. It also has an impact on our ending inventory on the balance sheet. So in our balance sheet under FIFO, if I sold item A, what remains is item B, $110. Under LIFO, if I assume that I sold item B, then what remains is item A, $100. And under weighted average, well, there's one unit left and we assign all of the units the same, $105 but it affects our assets on the balance sheet as well as it's going to affect our gross margin and therefore our net income on the income statement. So this chart displays what percentage of companies are using these various different inventory cost flow methods. Again, I don't know when this survey was done and I don't know what types of companies they surveyed, but um, these numbers don't shock me. They say 37% of companies are using FIFO, first in, first out. 23% are using LIFO, last in, first out. The same amount, 23% use weighted average. 10% did not disclose, and 13% had no inventory. So not sure when they had no inventory. Maybe they're service companies. Um, so kind of interesting, but we see more companies using FIFO and about the same amount using LIFO and weighted average um, that did not disclose. That might include some specific ID. They don't seem to factor that into this, but these are just some rough statistics. But the point being is that as a business person, you need to be familiar with all of these methods and understand, um, understand how to account for them and be, be aware of their differences. So, we're going to look at a little bit more complex example. Um, we're still at the mountain bike company and we have beginning inventory, which consists of 10 bikes at 200 each, which that's $2,000. And then in March, we buy 20 more bikes at 220 each. That's $4,400. And then in August, we buy another 25 bikes at 250 each. And that's 6,250. So we have a total of 55 bikes, right? 55, 10, 20, and 25. And the total cost of those 55 bikes, we summed up the cost of all of it. And that's where we're getting 55 bikes, 12,650. So then they tell us that we sold 43 of those bikes for $350 each. And it's going to be our job to compute our cost of goods sold and ending inventory under each of our three methods, FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. So under FIFO, we need to identify which of those units we're selling. Now remember, physically they're identical and we didn't keep track of which one is which, but on paper we have to make some cost flow assumptions. So under FIFO, we assume that we're going to sell off the beginning inventory first, so 10 units at 200. And then we assume that we're selling off the units from March, 20 units at 220. 
and then we assume that we're going to sell off part of the August purchase. So remember that was 25 units in total. So we're going to sell off 13 of those, right? Because we're selling 43 bikes. If we have 55 bikes and we sell 43, what's left in ending inventory? The other 12 units, right? So there's 12 units remaining in ending inventory. So if we do our math, we multiply 10 times 200 plus 20 times 220 plus 13 times 250. We come up with cost of goods sold of 9,650. So that's the 43 bikes that we sold. And what remains would be 12 more of these, 12 more from the August purchase, 12 at 250 equals 3,000. And of course, the sum of our cost of goods sold and our ending inventory has to add up to our total 12,650, our total goods available for sale. Remember, this goes back to my apples example. If I start the period with two apples and then I buy three more apples, I have five apples. At the end of the period, I have to be able to identify where those apples are. So if I count up my ending inventory and there's one apple remaining, that means the other four are cost of goods sold. Well, these are more units and more dollars and not apples, but the concept is still the same. If we have total goods available for sale of 12,650, at the end of the period, we have to be able to account for all of that. So if 3,000 remains in ending inventory, then our cost of goods sold is the rest of it, 9,650. I'm pointing that out because on your homework and just sometimes in real life, it's easier just to compute our ending inventory and then mathematically back our way into cost of goods sold. So if I know I have 12 units remaining at 250, I can quickly compute 3,000 and then 12,650 minus 3,000 gives me the 9,650. But I can verify it both ways. Probably as students just getting started on this, it's good to verify the number both ways but you'll probably get to a point where you'll see that one way might be faster than the other. So that's FIFO. Now we need to do it under LIFO. So under LIFO, we're gonna sell it in backwards order. We're still selling 43 units and we're gonna remain with 12 units in ending inventory. But the question is which ones are we selling and which ones are we keeping? So under LIFO, we're going to sell all 25 from the August purchase first. The last one's in, or the first one's out. And then we're going to sell 18 of the 20 units from the March purchase. So that's 18 at 220. So we multiply across, we add it up, and we have COGS of 10,000 to 10. And therefore, the rest, 12,650 minus 10,000 to 10, has to be our ending inventory which is 2,440, but we can think through our ending inventory as well. What's remaining is two units from the March purchase, so two times 220, plus 10 units at 200 from the beginning inventory. So 10 times 200 is 2,000, plus two times 220 is 440, and that equals 2,440. And then we do it once more under weighted average. So remember under weighted average, we take the total cost of the inventory, 12,650, and we divide it by the total number of units, which is 55, and we come up with an average cost of 230. Now, of course, we need to take a look. Does that make sense? Is it within our range, 200, 220, 250? Yeah, so 230 sounds right. And we're gonna apply that 230 both to our cost of goods sold, which is 43 units, and our ending inventory, which is the other 12 units. So to compute our COGS, we multiply 43 times 230 equals 9,890, and then our ending inventory is 12 units times 230 is 2,760, and of course they both, when we add them both up, we get the total of 12,650. So what does this do to our financial statements? Well, under FIFO, we look at our sales minus COGS equals gross margin. We get 5,400. 
LIFO, sales minus COGS equals gross margin. We get 48.40. And then weighted average is 51.60 in the middle. So what I want you to see is that FIFO is the highest, LIFO is the lowest, and weighted average should always be in the middle. Okay. When we go to our balance sheet and we look at our ending inventory, FIFO is the highest, LIFO is the lowest, and weighted average is in the middle. Down here at the bottom, I want you to pay attention to the statement of cash flows. Look, there's no difference. They're the same. Our inflow for customers and our outflow to purchase inventory is the same under FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. So until we get into conversation about income taxes, which we're gonna to get to here very shortly, until we get to paying income taxes, the cash flows are the same. Your customers don't care if you're using FIFO, LIFO, or weighted average. You still sold them 43 bikes at, I think it was $350 each. So your sales are the same, and they're either gonna pay you or not pay you, but it has nothing to do with whether it's FIFO, LIFO, weighted average. When it comes to our cash outflow to purchase inventory, same idea. Your vendor doesn't know and doesn't care if you're using FIFO, LIFO, or weighted average. You're either going to buy the inventory and pay for it, or you're gonna pay for it later, but your payment for that inventory, your cash outflow related to that inventory has nothing to do with your cost flow method. So thus far, we don't see any difference. Now that said, if we wanna bring in the impact of income taxes, now they just give us a partial income statement here, but we could assume that our net income is gonna be higher under FIFO, lower under LIFO, and somewhere in the middle under weighted average. And so the company with the higher net income is gonna end up paying more in income taxes. And when you actually pay those income taxes, that is cash leaving your bank account going to the government. So then FIFO would end up paying more taxes. LIFO would pay the lowest taxes and weighted average would be somewhere in the middle. So what we see is that FIFO is going to give us a stronger income statement and balance sheet because we're going to have lower COGS and higher gross margin and more ending inventory in the balance sheet, while LIFO is going to give us a little bit weaker financial statements. So lower gross margin, lower inventory in the balance sheet, but LIFO is going to have a tax advantage and get to keep more of their cash if they're paying less in taxes. So I want to head over to the textbook for a little bit, page 279, 280, and I want to talk about income statement versus tax return, inflation versus deflation, and then finally full disclosure and consistency. So let's head over to our textbook. All right, so we're in the textbook, roughly page 279. There's plenty of good reading here, but it's not my job to read at you. I just want to go through a couple sections down here. The income statement versus the tax return. So first, in some instances, companies may use one accounting method for financial reporting and a different method to compute income taxes. Well, that's interesting, right? Because we determined that FIFO was going to have a stronger financial statement, stronger net income on the income statement, stronger, higher inventory on the balance sheet, but LIFO was going to give us a tax advantage. So they're telling us that sometimes companies can use one method for financial reporting and a different method for income taxes. Well, that's great. So I'll use FIFO for financial reporting and LIFO for taxes. And they tell us that the tax return must explain any differences. With respect to LIFO, however, oh, details, right? The Internal Revenue Service requires that companies using LIFO for income tax purposes must also use LIFO for financial reporting. So no, you cannot have the best of both worlds. A company could not therefore get both the lower tax benefit provided by LIFO and the financial reporting advantage offered under FIFO. 
So no, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. So pick one or the other. And maybe that's why companies go with weighted average is that it's simple just to compute one weighted average cost and use that for everything. And it kind of splits the difference between the financial reporting advantage and the tax advantage. So maybe that's just kind of our way of finding some middle ground. Next topic, inflation versus deflation. So all of the examples that we looked at so far are what we call inflationary pricing, meaning the cost is going up over time. So going all the way back, first we bought item A at 100, then we bought item B at 110. In our more recent example, our beginning inventory was 200, and then we bought some more units at 220, and then we bought some more units at 250. So we have rising inventory prices. That's called inflationary. So most of the examples that we tend to look at are inflationary. And in fact, in reality, most companies operate in an inflationary environment. In a deflationary environment, the impact of using LIFO versus FIFO is reversed. LIFO produces tax advantages in an inflationary environment, while FIFO is going to produce tax advantages in a deflationary environment. So when we think of deflationary environments, most often things that we think of are things like um, technology. So the cost of technology type inventory tends to go down over time um, because we're constantly developing new, better technologies, right? So computers um, are a great example. Companies operating in the computer industry where prices are falling would obtain a tax advantage by using FIFO. In contrast, companies that sell medical supplies in an inflationary environment would obtain a tax advantage by using LIFO. So the advantage, the tax advantage gets reversed. So maybe if you're a company that operates in a deflationary environment, you want to use FIFO for the tax advantage on your tax return. And then for financial reporting, you could choose LIFO. I don't think there's any rules against that. Finally, full disclosure and consistency. These are gaps. Full disclosure is a gap, consistency is a gap. Generally accepted accounting principles allow each company to choose the inventory cost flow method best suited to its reporting needs. So they let you pick, but I mentioned earlier, ideally, ideally a company picks the method that does the best job of matching. So if you're obsessed with the matching concept the way I am, you want to have your physical flow of goods match your accounting cost flow of goods. Because results can vary considerably among methods, however, the gap principle of full disclosure requires that financial statements disclose the method chosen. In addition, so that a company's financial statements are comparable from year to year, the gap principle of consistency generally requires companies to use the same cost flow method each period. There's limited exceptions to the consistency principle that are described in more advanced accounting courses. I'm not sure I ever learned it in an accounting course, but I did it in the real world. Um, to change your inventory cost flow method, you have to apply to the IRS and you have to give them a good reason why you want to change your inventory cost flow method. And if you don't have a good reason, they're gonna reject the application. And a good reason isn't something like, I'd like to pay less taxes. They're not going to accept that. So when I worked at KPMG, one of the projects that we would do in the off season from tax returns, um, we would help our customers identify if they could save money and you know get a big windfall in tax savings in one given year by switching from one method to the other. Now, when, when we did this, the applications that were successful and accepted by the IRS were typically the ones where we cited matching as the reason. We want to change methods because we want our accounting records to match what is physically happening and therefore make them more accurate for the end users. So once you pick FIFO, LIFO, weighted average, specific ID, whatever it may be, you'd better like it. 
because there are very limited exceptions when you can change that method and you have to apply to the IRS and get their permission. So we need to make sure that we like whatever method we, we have selected. So we've covered these three topics lightly. Um, the other thing I want to offer you is just a simple tool to use, a basic example. Um, you're going to encounter questions in your homework, on your quiz, on your test that say things like, in, a, in an inflationary environment, which cost flow method will give you the highest gross margin or the lowest COGS or the highest ending inventory or the lowest taxes? And these aren't things that I want you to memorize. These are things that I want you to be able to quickly think through, um, not necessarily memorize, but really even just to quickly think them through, I, th I think can be challenging. I think it's best just to have a numeric example and be able to draw that out. So here's my really basic example. So let's say that we're a very small company and we have sales of one unit, I told you very small, one unit of sales at $5. Okay, and our inventory consists of two layers. We have one unit at $1, and then we have one more unit and this is chronological that we bought for $2. Okay, so that's, that's our facts. So really, really simple example, but let's see if we can put some numbers to it. So what we wanna do, we wanna be able to look at our sales minus COGS equals gross margin. And then separately, we also wanna identify our ending inventory. And we'll do this under FIFO and LIFO. And we don't have to do it under weighted average because the fact is that weighted average is going to be in the middle. Okay, so it's going to be in the middle. It's not going to be the highest or lowest. It's going to be in between FIFO and LIFO. So under FIFO, our sales is just $5. Our COGS under FIFO, we assume that we're selling the first unit first, so our COGS is going to be $1, and our gross margin is 5 minus 1 equals 4, and then our ending inventory is going to be $2. That's what's remaining. It's one unit, but it's $2. Okay, so these are all in dollars. Under LIFO, Sales is still $5, but now our COGS is going to be the second unit, right? We're going to sell them in backwards order. So COGS is $2, and therefore my gross margin is 5 minus 2 equals 3. And now my ending inventory is one unit, and that's $1. So with this information, if I asked you, okay, which inventory cost flow method is going to give you in an inflationary environment is going to give you the highest gross margin and we would say looks like FIFO right highest gross margin or I could say in an inflationary environment which one is going to give you the highest cost of goods sold LIFO or which one is going to give you the lowest ending inventory? Looks like LIFO. How about which one's going to pay the highest taxes? Hmm. Now that's not displayed here, but a higher gross margin is going to lead to a higher net income, is going to lead to higher income taxes. So FIFO is going to have the higher taxes. Did you catch all that? A higher gross margin it's going to lead to a higher net income, which will lead to higher taxes. So FIFO would have the highest taxes. 
But what if I asked you which one's going to have the highest or lowest in a deflationary environment? Uh-oh, do we have to redo our whole example? Now, here's a trick. If it asks you for deflationary, let's just switch our headings. So we'll just make this LIFO and this is now FIFO. Great. So now we're ready to do a deflationary example. So again, I could ask you those same types of questions. Which method will have the lowest cost of goods sold? Well, that would be here, and that's now LIFO in a deflationary environment. In a deflationary environment, which one's going to have the lowest ending inventory? Looks like FIFO. So really, when we switch to deflationary on this type of simple example, you can just switch your headings. I hope all that made sense, and I hope this is a simple tool that you can use just to think through some basic problems. But also just problem solving in general, this is the type of work that you'll need to do to answer questions about your COGS, gross margin, and ending inventory. Also, I wanted to give you a heads up. In your homework, um, they ask you to compute income taxes. And to be honest with you, both the slides and the text don't really give you much experience in doing that. Um, if you allow yourself to just walk through the process in the homework problems, it'll kind of walk you through it. But again, you're just kind of following the example blindly and not really knowing what you're going after. So a couple things I want to point out. Um, so on our income statement, we'll have our, sorry, we'll have our sales minus COGS is our gross margin. And then we'll subtract our operating expenses and we'll arrive at our operating income. And then they have us add or subtract our non-operating items, but they don't do that so much in this chapter. Here, now they have us deal with our taxes. So then we're gonna subtract our income tax and then we arrive at net income. If you, sorry, that's really sloppy. Um, if you do have non-operating items, um, they would go after your operating income. Um, they tend to call this figure operating income as earnings before interest and taxes. EBIT is a common phrase for that, earnings before interest and taxes. So then we would add and subtract any interest, we'll subtract our income tax, and arrive at net income. Um, another phrase for that would be income before tax. Okay, so that all means the same thing. <coughs> So if we were to put numbers to this, so let's say that we had sales of 200,000 and we subtract our COGS of 75,000 arriving at gross margin of 125,000. And then we have operating expenses of 25,000. So we subtract that and we arrive at our operating income or our income before tax, or in the real world often we say, earnings before interest and taxes, EBIT. I think your text will call it income before tax. And then they'll tell you a tax rate. So let's say that we have to pay 30% tax on 100,000. So then we're going to take 100,000 times 30%, which is 30,000, and we'll subtract that. So then our net income is 70,000. So I just want to give you a little sneak peek. You're going to need to do basic computations like this in your homework. And I didn't want it to surprise you and for you to look in the book and say, well, why don't they teach me this? Um, I'm not sure why they don't really go through the details of this in the book. But now we have an example. So refer back to this if you're stuck on that. Um, so if they ask you to compute tax, um, my advice would be go to the income statement and walk through these steps. Get to that income before tax or your operating income and then compute your income tax based on the percentage that they've given you. 
So next, we're going to look at an example when sales and purchases occur intermittently. Thus far, what we've looked at is examples where we buy everything in the first half of the year and then we sell all of it at once at the end of the year, which is totally unrealistic. So we'll get a little bit more realistic because the reality is a retailer, you buy and you sell and you sell and you buy and you buy, buy, buy and sell, sell, sell. And it happens intermittently throughout the year. So we're looking at the Never Stop Energy Bar. I could use a few of those. And we have beginning inventory, 100 units at $20. And then in February, we purchase 200 more at $21.50. And then in April, we sell. And then in June, we purchase 160 more at $22.50. And then in August, we have some more sales. And then in September, we purchase another 280 units at $23.50. What do you notice about the pricing? Is it inflationary or deflationary? So the pricing just when we're buying, right? So it starts at 20, goes to 2150, we sell at 30, it goes up to 2250, we still sell at 30, goes up to 2350, we still sell at 30. So we're dealing with inflationary pricing. So we're going to look at this using FIFO with the goal of determining our cost of goods sold and our inventory at the end of the year. So, well here, they just did it all for you. That's really easy, right? Mm, let's make sure we understand what they're doing here. So, we start with our beginning balance, 100 units at $20 equals 2,000. It looks like they've laid this out in Excel. If you're familiar with Excel, could you imagine setting this up and letting Excel do all the mathematics for you? Wouldn't that be a lot easier than crunching all these numbers on your calculator? Probably so. So then in February, we buy 200 units at $2,150. That's another $4,300. And then in April, we sell 220 units. And the question becomes, which units are we selling? Now, physically, there are all identical so we're not worried about which one is which but on paper we have a cost flow assumption for our accounting purposes so if we're selling 220 units we start by selling off the 100 from beginning inventory and 120 of these 200 so what's left is the other 80 of those 200 from February 14th so our cost of goods sold on the sale is 100 at 20 plus 120, 120 units at 2150. So we multiply across and we add them up. Cost of goods sold on that sale was 4580. And it's a very good habit to get into to reiterate what your inventory balance now is after that sale. So what remains is 80 of our February 14th unit, so 80 at 21.50. And then we buy another 160 units at 22.50. And then they tell us that we sell 100 units. So under FIFO, we're gonna be selling the first ones in, first ones out. So we start by selling off the 80 from February and we sell 20 of the units from our more recent purchase in June. So 80 times 21.50 plus 20 times 22.50, we multiply, we add it up, our cost of goods sold on that sale is 21.70. And again, we want to get in the habit of reiterating what our balance, our inventory balance now consists of, which is 140 units from the June 21st purchase. So 140 at 22.50. And then in September, we buy another 280 units at 23.50. And then finally in November, we sell 330 units. And the question becomes, which 330? Well, we're going to start by selling off these 140. Okay, those were actually from June. And then we're going to sell 190 of the 280. And the remaining 90 units will be our ending inventory. So 140 from the June purchase, 190 from the September purchase, right? 140 plus 190 equals 330 units. That's what we're trying to identify is which 330 units are we selling? 
So we multiply across, we add it up, and our cost of goods sold on that sale is 7615 And then our ending inventory balance consists of the remaining 90 units from our September purchase. So 90 at $2,350, our ending inventory is $2,115. Well, our COGS for the year is 14,365. Now, that's a lot of work. We need to approach it in a very systematic and orderly fashion, but it's not complicated math. We're not doing calculus or trig. It's multiplying, adding, and subtracting. So while it might look a little bit intimidating, maybe just because the amount of work and organization it takes, I have no doubt that you all have the math skills to do it. So just be patient with yourself, work through it slowly, step by step, and follow the inventory, right? Keep track of which units still remain. So if I asked you to do this under LIFO, could you do that? So if we know all the facts for the year, we could do it for LIFO. So Stay with me here just for a second. So under LIFO, we still have our same beginning balance of 100 units, and then we buy 200 units in February, and then we sell 220 units. So ignore what it has here, but which 220 units would we be selling under LIFO? Which 220 units would we be selling under LIFO? Usually, the answer I get from students is going to be, these 200 units from February, and then 20 of the beginning balance. So that's 220 units, and we sold them last in, first out. But I have bad news for you. That's wrong. I know, that's what I thought my first time taking accounting as well. When you sell 220 units under LIFO, you're selling these 220 units down here, 220 of those units, the last ones in, not the most recent ones in, the last ones in for the whole period, for the whole year. So when you make the sale in April, how do you know that your cost of goods sold is going to be based on a purchase in September? Or better yet, we could make another purchase at the end of December. How would we know then what our COGS is during the period? And the truth is, you wouldn't. You wouldn't know what your COGS is until the end of the period. Now, we could figure it out because we have all the facts for the entire year, and we really could walk through this example on a LIFO basis. We're not going to, but I just wanted to show you that, that it's not most recent in first out. It's truly the last ones in first out. I could say the same of weighted average as well. Back in February, when we make the sale of 220 units, our weighted average isn't just computed on the units that we have. It's going to be one weighted average for the whole year. So that'll include our units purchased in June and September as well. So at the time when we make the sale in April, we're not capable of computing the weighted average for the whole year. So that kind of poses a problem. We'll address that in just a little bit here. Um, for now, if I give you a problem like this, you'll only be asked to do it under FIFO. Okay, so we'll only ask you to do this under FIFO. Sometimes I refer to this as our FIFO layers, going through our layers of inventory, making sure we're accounting for our cost of goods sold in the proper order. And ultimately, what we came up with was our cost of goods sold was 14365 right, from here. And therefore, our gross margin was 5135 And this is what I was just referring to. When maintaining perpetual inventory records, which that's what we're doing, using the weighted average or LIFO cost flow methods leads to timing difficulties. Those are the timing difficulties that I was just speaking of. We can't technically compute LIFO or weighted average until we're actually at the end of the year. So mathematically, when we make a sale back in April, we don't know our COGS under LIFO or weighted average. And they tell us, but don't worry, further discussion of these methods is beyond the scope of this text. 
which sounds kind of scary, but essentially they're letting you off the hook. Just know that weighted average and LIFO can lead to these types of timing difficulties. In a little bit, we'll look at a technique that companies use in order to prepare interim financial statements. Our next topic is lower of cost or market. Um, way back in chapter one, you learned the historical cost concept. And we know that we want to record our assets on the books at cost, at what we paid for them. Um, there's very few exceptions to this rule. And what we're about to look at here, lower of cost or market rule for inventory valuation is one of those exceptions. So in general, yes, we do want to record our inventory at cost on our books when we purchase it. But at the end of each period, we do need to consider LCM, lower of cost or market. And what that's telling us is on our balance sheet at the end of the period, our inventory must be reported at the lower of cost or market. So market is defined as the replacement cost, not what we would sell it to a customer for, but what we could replace it for today. So for example, if I have a whole warehouse of widgets and it's burnt down in a fire overnight, what would it cost me today to buy all those widgets for? So not our selling price to a customer, but what it would cost to replace that inventory. And this whole idea of lower of cost or market is consistent with the conservatism principle. So of course, historical cost concept is one of our gaps, generally accepted accounting principles, but conservatism is another competing gap. So conservatism tells us we never want to overstate our net income. We also never want to overstate assets on our balance sheet, leading readers of the financial statements to believe that we're better off than we are. It's possible that we have inventory that has become outdated and is no longer as valuable as when we purchased it. So that could be a problem. If we bought a ton of, um, what's an example? Let's say that we bought a ton of laser disc players in the 90s. Do you even know what that is? It was like this couple minutes between VCRs and DVD players. So in between, there was this thing called the laser disc player, and it would play like a record size CD. And it was a huge disc that looked like a giant CD or a giant DVD. And supposedly the picture was so much clearer than from a VHS tape played by your VCR. Um, but again, we're still talking about old tube televisions back in the 90s. So how clear really was the picture? But anyhow, people saw it as this neat new technology. But it didn't last long because it was like moments later when somebody invented the DVD player. So let's say that I thought that laser disc players were all the rage. And so I bought a thousand units of laser disc players and now they're all just sitting in a warehouse. When you think about carrying that inventory on my balance sheet for all these years, it's not really fair. It's not really conservative to the readers of the financial statements for them to believe that I have this really valuable inventory asset because I don't. What I have is a warehouse of worthless junk that needs to be e-recycled. So when you think about the idea of changing the cost of our inventory or changing the inventory value on our balance sheet to the lower of cost or market, um, it seems like we're violating historical cost concept but we definitely have a duty to be conservative and not overstate our inventory on our balance sheet and potentially mislead the readers of our financial statements. That's a big no-no. So we can apply the LCM rule three different ways, potentially separately to each individual item or to major classes or categories of assets or to the whole inventory altogether. Now, what you need to be able to do, the actual application and actual marking down of the inventory is for a higher level course. What you guys need to be able to do is what I refer to as alligator math, greater than, less than. All you have to do is be able to identify the lower of cost or market, and that's it. 
So I don't need you to be able to do the journal entries, just be able to identify the lower figure. So to illustrate, assume the mountain bike company has ending inventory of 100 shirts and we purchase them at a cost of $14 each. So the first situation, the market price is now $18 to replace those shirts. So we're just gonna leave them alone at 14. But in the second situation, our cost is 14, but today we could replace them for 11. So we're gonna mark it down to 11 on our balance sheet. So we'll have to make some kind of entry there. But again, you don't have to make that entry. You just need to be able to identify that 11 is lower than 14. That's it. So a little bit more complicated example. Um, they show us the quantity of units, the unit cost, the unit market, the total cost, the total market. It's kind of information overload. Really what we need to look at is are we going to choose the cost or the market? Which one's lower? So if we go through and we just find the lower number, well, 6880 is lower than 7040, 7360 is lower than 8280, 9660 is lower than 10,350, and 4510 is lower than 5060. That's really it. That's all we need to be able to do in terms of lower cost or market. Know that the rule exists. Know that while it feels contradictory to historical cost concept, that it's co consistent with conservatism, and then be able to identify the lower of cost or market. So next we're gonna look at fraud and inventory control. We'll explore some of these ideas more in chapter six when we talk about internal controls and specific internal controls for inventory. Um, but for now, what we do know is that there is a significant amount of fraud that happens in inventory and COGS accounts. Because inventory and cost of goods sold accounts are so significant, meaning um, large in terms of volume, large in terms of dollar amounts. So lots of transactions in and out of inventory and COGS in a merchandising setting. Because of their size and their volume, they become attractive targets for concealing fraud. Um, now when we talk about concealing fraud, so let's say somebody internally at the company has cooked up some scheme that they're going to do something fraudulent and they somehow um, benefit from this stealing money or stealing inventory or maybe sending money or inventory to a friend or family member. Some kind of fraudulent scheme has been cooked up. So if they're going to hide or bury this fraudulent transaction, should they do it in an account that's rarely ever used and only has like 10 transactions in it for the year? Or should they bury it in an account like cost of goods sold or inventory that has tens of thousands of transactions to it during the year. Well, what would you pick? I would definitely bury it among COGS or inventory where there's a large volume of transactions. The likelihood of one transaction popping out and catching the eye of an auditor or another employee are reduced, where if we bury that transaction among only 10 other transactions, it might become kind of obvious that, hey, what is that? Why is that number sitting there? Um, again, of course, I wouldn't commit fraud, but if we're talking about how a criminal might think, somebody who is tempted to commit fraud might think, um, they, they would wanna bury it where there's lots of volume of activity. And because of this, auditors and financial analysts carefully examine them for signs of fraud. So cost of goods sold and inventory accounts are gonna be more carefully examined. Now, let's talk about audits just for a moment. When a company undergoes a financial audit, first, a financial audit is a normal and a good thing in the course of running a business. It's expected the company hires a firm to do their audit each year, and the auditors have procedures that they follow. First of all, it is not the auditor's job to go through each and every transaction and make sure that it's correct. That's not even close to their job. 
their job is going to be to take a statistical sampling of the transactions and review them and tie out that sampling to make sure that they are entered correctly. So they're not looking at every single transaction. And the auditors are not guaranteeing that the financial statements are exactly perfect. The auditors are going to make a statement as to whether they believe the financial statements are materially correct. Um, and that'll be based on statistics and a certain level of assurance. So if you've taken statistics, some of this terminology might sound familiar to you. But that said, the auditors are going to choose a sample size that is appropriate based on the numbers of the company. So they're going to statistically compute the sample size. But because COGS and inventory are attractive targets for fraud, they might increase that sample size and look at more transactions. So let's say normally uh, they do their numbers and they're supposed to look at 3% of the transactions. And because we're talking about inventory and COGS, they double it and they're going to look at 6% of the transactions. Now, if you are an employee that has committed fraud and has buried something in the cost of goods sold account, how do you feel about the auditors sampling 6% of the transactions? Hmm. Well, it makes me nervous, but mathematically, I feel 94% just fine. The likelihood of them finding one of my transactions there is only 6%. So it's statistically unlikely that they're going to sample that transaction. Now, if they do, I've got a real problem on my hands. So that's important to know about sample sizes and auditors and financial analysts examining them more carefully. So from a financial analyst standpoint, let's take a look at our inventory. So if our ending inventory is accurate, it was $4,000 during, excuse me, the beginning inventory is $4,000, and then we purchased $6,000, so we should have $10,000 of goods available for sale. And then we subtract our ending inventory, therefore our cost of goods sold should be $7,000. But let's say somebody at the company is doing something fraudulent. Um, and let's see, how would we come up with this scenario? Let's say that it's the end of the year and the supervisor says, hey, I need a few of you to volunteer to count inventory at year end. And most of you are thinking, yeah, I really don't want to do that. You, you have to stay overnight on December 31st on New Year's Eve and stay up all night counting inventory. This does not sound fun, right? And then the supervisor says, okay, how about double time? And suddenly a few hands start going up. Okay, I'll stay and count inventory. And I think, you know what? Yeah, I'm in. I'll stay and count inventory. So we're counting the inventory. Now, let me disclose. I'm a manager in the business, and I get a bonus if the company's gross margin is above a certain percent. All right, so I've disclosed that. And here I am counting the inventory. And when we count inventory at year end, we work in groups. So a couple people will be counting physical objects and one or two people will be then writing it down on the clipboard or punching it into a laptop. So let's say that you're counting inventory and you say, okay, there's 18 units of that. And I say, Eight, 80, 80 units? You said 18 and I write down 80. And then you say, okay, there's 15 units of these. And I say, okay, 50 units? Okay, got it. So I have somehow manipulated the data and I have overstated our ending inventory to be 4,000 by miscounting the ending inventory. So now the ending inventory is higher on paper than what it is physically, but in doing that, it forces us to change our cost of goods sold down to 6,000 because this computation has to work out. So we have $4,000 of inventory remaining, therefore our cost of goods sold can only be 6,000. So what happens? Sales minus COGS is gross margin. Our gross margin was supposed to be 4,000, but I lied about the ending inventory. So then we had to adjust our COGS down to 6,000 
which creates a higher gross margin of 5,000, and I just achieved my year-end bonus. Could you see how an employee could commit that type of fraud? It's pretty scary, right? This type of fraud typically is not caught in the first year, um, but often is caught in the second year because to perpetuate that, I'm gonna to have to volunteer to count inventory again. And if you look at the balance sheet, we have $4,000 of inventory. So if we go into the second year, and now it's time to count inventory at year end again, first of all, we're starting with an overstated inventory number. So I'm gonna to have to lie by twice as much in order to make the numbers look consistent and to achieve my bonus again. So I'd have to double that lie. If I carried this into a third year, it becomes exponential. So at some point, we're gonna look back there and say, what do you mean there's $10,000 of inventory? There's only two items. So we start to see this discrepancy between the physical inventory and the inventory that we claim to have on the books. And that's when the fraud is caught. Oftentimes after doing this for a year or two, an employee will stop doing it and the mess will unravel itself. But going back to the idea that financial analysts are going to look at these numbers more carefully. They're going to look at your COGS and your gross margin and your gross margin percentage carefully. And when there's fluctuations, they're, they're going to want to know why. And so we need to be able to explain that. So auditors and financial analysts can help us detect and prevent this type of fraud from happening. Now, a couple other suggestions in terms of preventing that fraud. Um, we'll deal with it more in chapter six under internal controls, but certainly if I receive a bonus for achieving a certain gross margin percentage, I should not be allowed to count inventory because I put, I'm potentially going to be motivated to overstate the ending inventory. Next, we need to look at the gross margin method to estimate our ending inventory. You know how we talked about previously that using LIFO or weighted average method was not going to work at the time of sale. So we're gonna use the gross margin method for interim financial statements when we need to estimate the ending inventory and cost of goods sold. So for a company that uses weighted average or LIFO, we might need to use this technique during the year to produce interim financial statements. So here's the steps, which I find to be a bit wordy. Um, we're gonna calculate the expected gross margin ratio based on prior period's income statement. We're gonna multiply that gross margin ratio by the current period sales to estimate our gross margin. We're gonna subtract the estimated gross margin from our sales to get our COGS, and then we'll subtract the estimated COGS from the amount of goods available for, for sale to get our ending inventory. So if we have this example, beginning inventory is 5,100. We have purchases of 18,500 and goods available for sale of 23,600. And we need to produce financial statements for the first six months of the year through June 30th, but we use LIFO or weighted average and therefore we can't compute these numbers technically. So instead, we're going to look back at our gross margin from prior years, and it's 25%. So if we take 22,000 times 25%, that would be our estimated gross margin. What do you get? 22,000 times 0.25, we should get a gross margin of 5,500. Okay. So then our estimated cost of goods sold, what would that work out to? Well, 22,000 minus 5,500, 22,000 minus 5,500. We should get 16,500 as our estimated COGS. Did we get that as well? Or another way to look at it, it would be the other 75% of sales, right? If 25% of sales is gross margin, 
then our COGS is the other 75%. So I can compute that two different ways. And if my goods available for sale are 23,600 and I'm estimating my COGS to be 16,500, then I subtract that to arrive at my ending inventory. So 23,600 minus 16,500, I get estimated ending inventory of 7,100. So that's the gross margin method to estimate our COGS and ending inventory. And finally, we have a couple ratios to look at. First, we have inventory turnover. So the inventory turnover ratio measures how quickly a company sells its merchandise inventory. When it comes to merchandising companies, they always want to sell their inventory more quickly. As long as they have a positive gross margin, their goal should be to sell the inventory as quickly as possible. So we can compute this by taking our cost of goods sold and dividing it by our ending inventory from the balance sheet. Um, so let's say that we have cost of goods sold of 100,000, and we're dividing it by our ending inventory on the balance sheet, which is 10,000. So our inventory turnover is 10, right? If we do the math, 100,000 divided by 10,000 is 10. 10 what? $10, 10%. It's 10 turnovers or 10 times, meaning that we could buy inventory, sell it all, buy inventory, sell it all. We could do that 10 times during the year based on these numbers. So we'd want to have a higher turnover, would be more volume of sales, which is good. Um, but typically, we just use this as a first step in calculating the average number of days to sell inventory. So we're gonna take 365 days in a year divided by our inventory turnover, which we computed to be 10. So we'd say that we our average days to sell inventory is 36.5 days. So all other things equal, the company with the lower average number of days to sell inventory is doing better. They're managing their inventory better. Um, if you are a merchandise manager for a retailer, um, this is an important number for you in terms of understanding how quickly inventory moves. It could signify which inventory items you should or should not carry um, if you do it on an item by item basis. Um, it also helps you understand when you need to reorder more inventory, knowing that it takes about 36.5 days to sell the inventory it's going to clue you in when you might need to reorder to make sure you don't run out of stock. Um, also, having an idea of when to reorder helps you plan your cash flow appropriately. So in the real world, these ratios are super useful in a merchandising environment. So let's look at a couple companies. Notice that they have separated these out by industry. We don't just blend the different industries together. So we've got fast food. They're looking at McDonald's, Starbucks, and Yum. What's Yum? Do you know what Yum is? Yum with an exc exclamation point. Um, yum is kind of a conglomerate that consists of, I believe it's Taco Bell, KFC, Pizza Hut, Long John Silver, and A&W. At least that's what it used to be. There may have been some shifting around in there, but that was the five that made up Yum! Brands. So a big fast food conglomerate with lots of different brands. Now, Starbucks, some might argue, well, maybe Starbucks doesn't belong in there. They're not really like traditional fast food. It's like coffee. We should just compare it to other coffee restaurants. But let's see here. So we've got McDonald's with their average number of days to sell inventory is seven. Starbucks at 32, and Yum! Brands at 17. Hmm, does any of this surprise you? Well, let's think about Starbucks. Their inventory, sure, they have plenty of milk and dairy products, that kind of stuff that are perishable, but the bulk of their inventory is going to be coffee. Coffee, coffee beans. So not that perishable. 
and maybe it's okay that it takes them longer to sell their inventory. <coughs> Where a company like McDonald's, um, when they order their inventory, most of it arrives frozen and then they cook it, they prepare it, I guess we could say, and then they serve it to us. Um, so this doesn't mean that my cheeseburger with extra ketchup and extra pickles has been sitting under a heat lamp waiting for me for seven days. Um, it means from the time that, they, that the ingredients arrive, so the buns and the frozen meat patties and the cheese and the lettuce, from the time that that arrives, it's an average of seven days to when you sell it. Yum Brands is a little bit slower, um, but again, so if you think of, you know, Taco Bell, KFC, Pizza Hut, um, yeah, that might be okay. It just depends on what condition that inventory is in. Is it frozen? Um, I know at Taco Bell, one of my sister's first jobs as a teenager was at Taco Bell. And she came home from work. This is my older sister. And she came home from work and she told me how they make the beans at Taco Bell. I have not been to Taco Bell since. Um, but there's really not much perishable about it. So those beans could sit around for a very long time. Um, but big picture, the company that's selling the inventory faster is doing better. Um, and I would agree, McDonald's is doing better. Um whether or not you like the food at McDonald's or Taco Bell or any of these places is irrelevant. Um, McDonald's has been a poster child of how to run a business for a long time. Um, they run a really tight ship. They have very stringent rules in terms of their franchises, um, but their branding is phenomenal. They are a worldwide recognized name in the fast food industry. Um, and their reputation is quite good. I mean, you're not going to McDonald's to get the best steakhouse quality burger, but you know what to expect. And the food is, you know, as expected and reasonable prices. So, um, but in terms of the overall management of their inventory systems and their products and their branding and their product pricing, McDonald's is a really well-run company. So it doesn't surprise me that they have the lowest number of days to sell. If we look at department st stores, I'm not sure I call Walmart a department store. I call it a discount store, but I guess it's a big store and it has lots of departments. So they're comparing it to Macy's. Does it surprise you that Macy's is 117 days while Walmart's at 45? It doesn't surprise me one bit. Macy's is not doing well. Macy's is struggling financially to hold on. Um, they are not moving inventory very quickly. And then you've got Walmart and Walmart has all kinds of goods that Macy's doesn't carry, including groceries. So those are going to need to be sold faster. Um, but Walmart, again, I don't like shopping at Walmart. It makes me kind of crazy. But that said, Walmart has a lot of great business lessons in terms of how to, um, manage your supply chain and move inventory and, I mean, they're doing this on a sizable scale, a massive scale. So Walmart is quite impressive in terms of how they run their business. That doesn't mean you have to like them, but there's definitely some business lessons to be learned in there. So it doesn't surprise me at all that Walmart is much lower than Macy's. And then finally, we have home construction. I'm not sure if you're familiar with either of these builders, but DR Horton tends to be more of entry level homes while Toll Brothers tends to be higher end, larger homes, um, it's a little bit more expensive. So it doesn't surprise me that DR Horton has a lower average number of days to sell inventory. Now, clearly it's not fair to compare the home construction industry to the fast food industry. Why is McDonald's at seven days and Toll Brothers at 796 days? Well, they're totally different businesses. In home construction, your inventory starts when you buy land and then you have to pull permits and then you have to do all of the work that goes into building a home and then you have to sell the home and go through the escrow process and actually close on the sale of that home. So it doesn't surprise me in the least that DR Horton is at 433 days. I think Toll Brothers might be a little bit high at 796, but they're building larger homes with more um, 
customization. Um, and there's a smaller market for these larger, more expensive homes versus entry level first time home buyer types of homes. So um, I guess maybe not that surprising. So again, average number of days to sell inventory, companies that move their inventory faster are usually doing better. But again, we need to look at industries separately. All right, you guys, that's it for chapter five. Make sure you practice FIFO, LIFO, weighted average and do that homework. And let me know if you guys have any questions. Thanks for sticking with me.